bit of a data theme continuing um, as we talk a little bit about automation and, and IoT and data. So uh, I will welcome Sam and Rob. Gentlemen, thank you uh, for joining us here. Uh, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, uh, I hope you had the opportunity to listen to, to Anthony and, and Jim pr previously, always inspiring. And um, uh, soaked, I, we soaked it all in. We, yeah, I, we every, time I, every time I talk to Anthony, I, I, I soak <laughs> a lot in. <laughs> feel completely intellectually inferior, um, but, but, but that's okay. Um, well, gentlemen, thanks. So let's, let's jump right in because we got a lot to talk about. Um, let's just do quick uh, kind of uh, name rank serial number with introduction. Sam, we'll start with you and you're from BMC and we're, we're really grateful for BMC's su support here uh, uh, for, um, for CDX and everything we've been doing at Teconomy as well. Absolutely, Drew, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, welcome. Um, let me start by introducing the company I work at, BMC. So uh, what BMC does is uh, like, uh, much like what Anthony was talking about, helps us customers drive innovation through agility, customer centricity, uh, actionable insights, you know, to, to deliver the growth and thrive in this disruptive market. Um, my name is Sam Lukundi and I'm the Vice President of Innovation and Head of uh, BMC Innovation Labs. Great, thank you, Sam. Rob? Yeah, Rob Tiffany. I work for a company called Ericsson. So it's a Swedish company. If you don't know who they are in the US, just it's probably kind of like Intel inside or something. We make the cellular gear that mobile operators buy to build all the cellular networks that you use for your smartphones and stuff. And so right now, as you can imagine, there's no shortage of hysteria around 5G. And so that's where we're spending most of our time is rolling that out in the world. Uh, I'm the VP and head of IoT strategy. Uh, because I've done this IoT stuff way, way too long. And so it's, I'm in that rut. And a shout out to BMC over there. I actually used to live in a neighborhood across the freeway from BMC's headquarters in Houston. So it's a small world. Indeed it is. And um, yeah, if any of you have been to an IoT conference in the last 10 years, you've probably seen Rob somewhere. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so Sam, I want to set up the conversation because we do want to talk about automation and, and BMC talks about the autonomous digital enterprise. Can, can you share with us briefly and set that up in terms of what, what you consider sort of autonomy or an autonomous enterprise, much less an autonomous digital enterprise today? What is, what is the theory and philosophy behind that? Um, yeah, so to help answer that question, let me set some context too, right? Um, so the persistent disruption of 2020 hasn't evaporated uh, with the turn of the calendar naturally, right? So 2021 continues with its own challenges as we just saw last week uh, in one part of the country. Um, and companies that basically rode out of the turmoil or, or thrived in the face of it, uh, transformed that process at, at extraordinary rate. Now what we're looking at is other steps that take to move you know, this, this momentum fast forward. So the autonomous digital enterprise is a future state framework where companies such as Ericsson and, and many others, right, who use our technology, uh, embrace intelligent tech-enabled systems across every facet of the business through emerging technologies like automation, which is, happens to be the theme of the day here. So. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, and, and particularly within the context of, of telecommunications, how are you working with firms like Ericsson and other companies in the telco space um, to, to help them become the autonomous digital enterprise, if you will? And, and what does that mean for telecommunications companies? And then maybe at the end of the day, what does that ultimately maybe even mean for the customer? Correct. So, um, in order to you know, explain that, let me share with you some a journey that we took with the autonomous digital enterprise, right? So given that I'm here in, in Florida, in sunny Florida, um, it's not so sunny today, but, uh, <laughs> but the fact is that you know, uh, we have a customer here and just let me take an example because I'm, I'm here of Tampa General Hospital, right? So they use our application workflow orchestration engine, uh, some, uh, a product called as ControlM, that helps them monitor uh, intensive care capacity and conditions as part of the efforts to combat COVID-19, which is, you know, the, to the topic of, uh, probably will be the topic of the century, if, if, uh, if not of uh, the last uh, decade or so, uh, across 
a network of health providers and hospitals in the region. All of these processes are fully automated, right? So, so think about that autonomous digital enterprise as an example of hyper automation, right? Where a process is devoid of you know, complete uh, backend human responses and that have completely automated from uh, end to end using multiple technologies that are there, right? Mm. So the AD, uh, you know, fundamentally, uh, you know, allows via hyper automation and others uh, allows, you know, companies like telecom companies and, and other customers, um, you know, to automatically perform all these tasks through AI, enhanced connectivity and digitization, right? By automating the overall business process, enterprises, in my view, can reduce both these potential errors and human involvement in a lot of these menial tasks, which is for us, the autonomous enterprise. Right. Got it. Thank you. Um, and, and Rob, you know, um, before we dig in a little bit on, on where all this fits um, for a company like Ericsson and, and all of this data washing about, what is, what is the, the state of IoT? The, the conventional wisdom, if you, I don't know, watch CNBC or watch some of these other programs is, you know, it's still searching for its business model or, you know, I, you know um, and it hasn't arrived yet. And I, I don't know, I think, I think all of that's a bit unfair, but you, you do this every day for one of the largest telecommunications companies in the world. What is the state of IoT from your perspective and, and what's been happening the last few years? We were supposed to be at, you know, eight gazillion connected devices by today. <laughs> um, and, and maybe and maybe we're not, but but how do you, how do you see it? Yeah, well, no doubt about it. It's been like one step forward and two steps back. And, uh, and certainly during this time of COVID and the associated economic downturn, collapse, whatever, uh, yeah, it's been tough stuff. I mean, I, I see two things actually happen at the same time. So no doubt IoT has not progressed. I, even my own company, I'm just going to go ahead and blame my own company and GE <laughs> and a bunch of other analysts in Cisco for telling the whole world that by last year, we'd be at 50 billion connected IoT devices. Maybe we're at 9 billion, maybe 10, I don't know. And maybe that's not the right way to look at it you know um i think it's better to look at value you know right i tried to you know after being in this space so long um where you know, building platforms building this technology used to be so important to me and it still is but at some point you have to realize that that's not the thing iot is just a ne it's necessary plumbing um to drive what sam's doing is the real reality right. of all this mm -hmm. it's conduits to endpoints, right? To devices, to sensors, to control actuators. Um, and so uh, the, the, the real value clearly is in the analytics and the outcomes and the apps that you're delivering. Um, and so uh, I think we're seeing a lot of growth in that side of the world. Um, I think IoT, and I don't wanna get into, unless you want to all the frictions and stuff like that, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's messy. It's a bigger problem. It's more complex than I think people thought. Um, right. I know a lot of people, we've probably talked about this before. I know a lot of people are like, we had this awesome smartphone revolution <laughs> that just exploded and it's bigger. This is the number one product ever made on the planet Earth, the iPhone. Nothing is sold, no product sold more than this thing. And the associated apps, and we were hoping IT was going to be just like that. But it turns out it's a lot more complicated. It requires lots of different skill sets, disciplines. Uh, you actually have to go out and connect, connect things, configure things. And so it just takes a lot of time. Um, uh, and it's unfortunate. I think we spent a lot of time on unvaluable activities. The, the value mm -hmm. for the, the customer is doing IoT because they want to deride, they want to increase safety, they want to make more money. They want to, because IoT and all these facilitates new business models that you couldn't do before and, and kind of SaaS type business models. That's what they want to do. Uh, but to get to that part, you have to do all this boring, ugly stuff, like configuring and programming a bunch of devices. Right. And so I think that's that. And so uh, we got to blow away some of that friction to get things sped up. And Rob, and, and then this question will lead uh, in, into where we'll go with you, Sam, um, because hopefully there will be more devices and more data uh, and more automation required. But, but Rob, how will 5G affect IoT? How will 
people that affect the marketplace um, just broadly. Um, whether it's you know we all if you watch TV at all I and mean, you see with AT and T and T Mobile and or T Mobile Sprint and uh, yeah. uh, and Verizon are telling us about what five G is going to do for our personal lives. But what will five G do for for the IoT ecosystem? Right. So the average person when they think of five G, they're thinking of things getting really fast on their phone, faster cat videos, the important stuff. Right. Uh, at, you know, uh, at, that's why you see millimeter wave being deployed by Verizon at all these football stadiums that are unfortunately empty. It would have been great to have people in there because right. that's how you get really, really high speeds at those high frequencies. It doesn't go very far though. Um, but for IoT, uh, it's a little different. It's not just faster things. Part of it sometimes is lower latency. Um, right. You know, we're gonna have, well, you know, we have, a, we have the notion of autonomous cars. They're thinking for themselves and they're making decisions, but it doesn't mean that they're not gonna be connected. They'll, in the future, you hear terms like V to X or whatever. And so cars will communicate with each other, they'll communicate with traffic signals. The cities will be much more intelligent. Well, as it turns out, though, to make that really work, we needed low, really, really low latency technologies, communications like 5G, which is something we just haven't had. Um, they need to react really quickly. Uh, the other thing is we've tried lots of smart city initiatives uh, and, and those are tough because you're dealing with city hall and bureaucracy and cities don't seem to have any money. And so that's, that's always a struggle, but let's assume that it wasn't a struggle in the past and they were all a, a really big hit. It turns out we would have hit network bottlenecks before we got to any critical mass and, but we didn't because it, it's been tough. And so what I mean by that, if you're in a building connecting to just Wi-Fi, you're talking, you know, dozens of connections, maybe a few hundred tops. If you're talking about cellular today, like see your cellular tower out the window, you might be talking a thousand, maybe a couple of thousand connections. Mm. In a smart city where you all of a sudden have things sending telemetry <clears throat> to make things smart, to make intelligent decisions, to actuate things, it turns out we would have hit big bottlenecks. So 5G, the one thing that no one talks about is this massive increase in capacity. So now with 5G, in the square kilometer around each cell tower, we're going to be able to connect a million simultaneously connected devices streaming telemetry at the same time. Wow, wow. So the floodgates are open with 5G. And so hopefully we'll get our act together with these projects uh, and Sam's going to automate all these people. <laughs> Yo, right. that's, well, that, that's, that's the segue I'm looking for right there. But yeah, so Sam, what, uh, you know, um, yes, from a common sense standpoint, and obviously what Rob says, um, you know, more devices connected, more capacity is going to be more data, which I'm sure that makes, that makes BMC very happy. That's so, but, you know, as it relates to the data and what you're looking to automate and help companies automate, um, is it simply an issue of volume and more data or will 5G and the proliferation of devices um, and different types of devices and are they all sort of speaking the same language is it the same type of data that you're going to be helping companies process or will different types of data um result um from 5g and and the implementation or, or i should say just the, the 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 extension now of all this capacity what's it, what's it delivering back to you and and your clients yeah so you know um so on the insights that rob gave um drew i, I think yeah so the so with 5G, you're looking at, you know, in my view, at least a, a difference, you know, I mean, uh, you know, non-conventional IoT data, which we knew, right? I mean, IoT has been around, like Rob said, for, uh, you know, since, <laughs> since forever, right? <laughs> right. You know, uh, as you're well aware, right? So if I go to oil and gas company and talk about IoT, they're like, what are you talking about, right? We've been doing it for years, right? So, so how is this all different now, right? So like Rob said, I think the key difference is not the IoT itself, the, uh, but it's it's really about how you use that data. Well, how you know how you bring uh, uh, meaningful insights into it, right? How you observe, you know, how you bring observability and actionability into that data. That actually is is key. And to the question that you asked about the five G and, and the data that it'll bring, right? So what we are doing is because we realize that data is not going to come from you know, some place where, you know, a controller gets that data, then it passes it on to a cloud and it, you know, accumulates on the cloud and then it comes back and, and then we are making insights. A lot of the data now in our, in, in our world, we see is being actually collected right at the edge, processed at the edge, 
and even yeah. probably discarded and you know edge analytics edge computing have taken a new form because of data that we can actually get right and then you only send either you know uh, things that are anomalies out to the cloud and that's really what 5g enables now think about a mining company or thing you know which which is working you know for example one of our largest customers in australia uh, works with telstra and a mining company so their biggest customer and their biggest use cases are not in telecom but they're actually in mining why tons of mines in australia think about the number of earth movers you know sitting out there you know in the mines but then all of the data they being collected every single time a wheel moves and these are like wheels as big as three story homes right and so everything mm -hmm. i got to monitor you know the pressure the 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 uh, you know vis you know the viscosity of the tire and you know and and so on and so on right you know the vibration and i'm making decisions you know in in rapid succession right so i can't let that mine that that earth mover uh, fail in the middle of a of a hall because that is millions of dollars of loss so that kind of data is now really what what 5g and iot will bring together right in in the view that i look at so yeah and yeah it is it is a good point and and following up on that um, Sam, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing your CTO, and I want to start to get into what this data can do in terms of helping a company and helping an enterprise and, and looking at enterprise operations. And he had talked about like if IT equipment fails, right? And, and he had talked about, you know, in the context of understanding, we used to know what has failed. The data used to tell us, oh, it's failed. Yeah. This 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 system has failed, um, but it's it's going and that's you know sort of observability, right? Um, yes. And ultimately, but like you know, why did it fail? Mm -hmm. And then can the can the systems can the automation even fix the problem, right? I mean, is that where we're going with data, and that's where artificial intelligence is applied, right? Where it's not just okay. Okay, I got data out there telling me, okay, like, you know, this, the, this mine is empty, we need to, you know, or we need, or we need, we need more trucks over here. Um, but um, it's not just fixing the problem, it's not just understanding there's a problem, diagnosing the problem, but even getting to the place where automation can, can fix the problem. That's correct, right? So to answer that question, right, Drew, you know, I think, um, let's be clear about what observability and actionability means, right? Observability is, is, in my view, is the ability to determine the internal state of a system uh, based on external available inputs and therefore um, understanding the performance of these individual hardware components and systems. Now, if you take that actionability, which goes and exactly what, your, what the question is, is it goes a step further to look at how to respond to a failure beyond, beyond why, why, what failed and why it failed. So it looks at what you can do uh, about it in the moment to remediate it or use advanced insights to get ahead of it and take preventive action to prevent it. You know, a good uh, analogy of that is, I don't know if you guys have seen this, this is a brilliant ad, I think, by IBM. So, you know, he goes in front of a, a receptionist and he says, hey, listen, I'm here to fix uh, the elevator. And she says, right. but the elevator is just fine. And then that's really when they realize that, oh my God, it's broken already, right? Or, right. or I mean, the point is he should have come days before it broke, not when it, when it just like stopped right. at that point. That is advanced insights and actionability, right? And, and I think that's really where the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning can help with these things like anomaly detection, event correlation, and this remediation data, as we call it, right? Um, is key to have interception for both this observability and actionability. Right. Um, and, and Rob, you know, you had mentioned the edge and, the, you know, I think those of us who, who follow, you know, your industry reasonably closely understand what the edge is. But for those out there who may not, not just explain briefly what the edge is, but, but explain why um, the edge and, and um, processing that can happen there, data that can be captured there. What, why is it so game-changing? Yeah, well, don't overthink it. It's just a location. <laughs> um, and it turns out there are many edges. I used to think I knew what the edge was. I spent, when I was doing Lumata at Hitachi, I was living in Japanese factories and edge computing, fog computing, a lot of that stuff. It's stuff they've done forever. You know, the edge meant I need to get as close to the source of the data as possible. Mm -hmm. And so it could mean this rugged looking little PC that's with serial ports talking to PLCs or different machines, could be aggregating a bunch of machines. Um, 
I've we've done what we've rolled in racks of servers that were kind of big fat edge type things that could really do some serious computing. Um, when I moved to Ericsson, a new thing about edge popped up out of nowhere. And it was the idea that this kind of telco edge and a 5G edge. And you're like, what in the world is that? Well, the idea is still the same. You're trying to capture the data as close to the source of the data as possible. Because as you get farther away, what do you have? The latency. You know, if I'm right next to it on the LAN, it's this many milliseconds. If I'm way out here, if I'm going out onto the network, out to the open, you know, because a lot of the people's problems was, I think a bill of goods had been sold to a lot of folks that said IoT had to be in the cloud. Uh, and it's like, you know, mm -hmm. Sam said, that's, that's just not the case. Uh, some people need responses immediately to, to analytics and they can't wait to send data over expensive, expensive bandwidth to a distant cloud for it to munch on the data and analyze it and give you a question back. Sometimes you need stuff on the factory floor, on the bullet train, whatever. And so the edge was saying, hey, let's use Moore's law and some other things and let's bring that big compute power we thought we needed the cloud to do. It turns out we can do a whole lot of stuff locally. And it doesn't always have to be some kind of scary machine learning or deep learning and stuff like that. I, I can't tell you how much value is gained, how you move the needle from just simple. I think a lot of edge started with filtering, just simple filtering. It was to filter to the cloud so you didn't send too much data. Like if this new, if the values in this new packet equal to the previous one, drop the packet, things like right. that. Right. And, and then it went to simple analytics. You see a lot of people with complex event processors on edge devices, you know, if this, then that threshold type stuff, which is really typical in manufacturing for years, layering that on, doing some pattern matching. And it's still important to do all that stuff. And I'd say grab all that low hanging fruit first. Uh, and then with what's left over, then, then apply, uh, you know, machine learning or whatever type of analytics you need to it, but doing it close to where it happens get the answer when you need it. It's also a data governance thing too. And it's a security mm. thing. I absolutely mm. work, you know, lots of folks in different parts of the world still say the data doesn't leave my factory. And so if you want to play ball with them, then you need a solution that's going to run inside the factory. And so uh, the edge played a big role with their, uh, that too. Interesting. And, you know, you mentioned low hanging fruit. So Sam, my, my question for you, as it relates to 5G and the edge and some of these innovations that Rob's talking about, what industries now, um, you know, mining, okay, we get manufacturing, warehouses, maybe fleet management. These are a lot of industries that have adopted a lot of this IoT already. You know, what will 5G and the edge and, and, um, and the ability to, to automate, you know, the data and create great insights and create great products, what, what are the next industries that could be impacted by this, Sam? And then Rob, I'd like your thoughts on that too. Yeah, so my view is right in the next, um, I would say decade or, or, or so, right? I, I think 5G, the, 5, the future of 5G uh, will look completely different, right? Um, like some of the things that Rob said about smart cities and so on, and the government regulations around that, you know, probably will start getting eased up uh, and so on. So, but I, my, my view is that, and, we're, and this is not just my view, this is about talking to customers on, on the journey that they are taking, right? So they are planning on, you know, enterprise 2025, right? You know, there's, there's a great article by BMC on, on what that really means. And, and then as we get into conversations, I see this, we will see large scale automation of vehicles and utility services like waste management and energy production through smart grids and smart environmental monitoring to cut down like, you know, things like greenhouse uh, gases and pollution. Or think about like use cases that we have talked to, right? To some of our customers or, or even in the Nordics, you know, where uh, uh, Rob's uh, headquarters are, right? You know, so, you know, where we have talked about the, the ability for us to actually see, think about a smart car parked in a garage and like to gain wireless charging through a city grid uh, while you can work and, you know, while you work and then messaging your car to drive in itself from the parking to a uh, lot to your to your office door and again that's really the vision that Elon Musk has right like hey you buy a Tesla it's not your Tesla it's something that you buy and you make money out of it that's really you know but that comes through this full-blown automation and IoT really kicking in right. into 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 high gear and then lastly getting out of that and like talking about farmers in a rural areas where they're able to monitor and track crops livestock machinery through these drones and super dense like sensor networks. I really think that's really where it's going. And you know, it's not going, I, we see this 
happening, right? It's almost right. every and, day. And Rob, same question. You know, maybe what are the couple industries that you think maybe we don't talk about a lot, but you think are really ripe for transformation and innovation because of um, 5G, IoT, the edge, and and sort of automation? Yeah. Sam already used up all my ideas. Um, <laughs> you know what? Um, uh, I'll give you a few things. Uh, well, to, to chime in with the farming thing. Um, and, and he mentioned uh, Telstra in Australia, for instance. Yeah. So there's this other part of 5G, and it's part of LTE, 4G as well. It's called NBIoT and LTEM. And so it's narrowband stuff, kind of like, you know, LoRaWAN and Sigfox, where you're just sending a little a few bytes of data. Um, we did, uh, there's technology, we did a deal with Telstra where we were able to, from a cell tower to beam uh, our MBIOT signal uh, over a hundred kilometers in range from the cell tower. Because um, mm -hmm. no doubt we all know that a big problem we have in rural parts of all the different countries around the world is there's not good coverage usually. And it's all, everything's about money, make no mistake. And so if there's not a lot of people there, mobile operators are less inclined to build a cell tower and fiber backhaul to serve a handful of people in a little small town or in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and so we'll need things like that, you know, being able to beam signal further with what we have. Um, so that's gonna help people in agriculture for sure. I think agriculture, you're hearing a lot about precision agriculture and smart farming. I think that's, they're, they're having their moment here. Uh, you know, we have a giant planet with a whole lot of people and we need to make more food. We're gonna to have to make a whole lot more food actually. Right. And so we gotta get better at crop yields. We also lose a lot of food in the supply chain, getting food to market, like a high percentage, you'd be horrified. We gotta get better with smarter supply chains so we don't lose that food. And then we have ugly food that people don't wanna buy that's perfectly good at the market and it spoils. And so there's a lot of stuff around there that could get some help. Um, the other thing I'll just say broadly uh, that doesn't get talked about, uh, but it's kind of one of my passions I work on personally is if you're familiar with the United, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, you yeah. know, we've got till 2030 to hit about 17 of these things. Poverty, you know, hunger, water issue, climate change. There are absolutely so many great use cases where IoT and analytics, and I'm not talking rocket science, just simple things can make such a difference in a lot of these things. They're not about commerce and making right. money. They're about helping society. Uh, Absolutely. And so I think a lot, of, a lot of growth there. Yeah, and we have to wrap up. Um, I've got Jared Dicker coming up next. We're going to talk about the Washington Post. We're certainly going to talk about some consumer applications and right. you know 5G and how that's going to impact some of their products. I look forward to asking Jared about that. But before I let you both go, you know, anytime you know one of the G's, five, you know, 5G now is is getting marketing saturation. That means it's time to talk about the next G. So you know, don't do it. I know. Don't I, do you, it. You know, I'm going to ask you, Rob, don't and, say of course, it. and and Sam as well. So just you know, 30 seconds or less. Um, and hey. If you're going to say, hey, look, 6G is just a little bit more of an advanced 5G, no big step changes, that's fine too. I mean, you know, I don't know. So I'm asking you. So Rob, real quick, and then Sam, real quick, you know, 6G and, you know, what, what will that future look like? Um, is it a huge step change from 5G and how it might affect IoT and, and, and automation or, or not? Well, I don't want to say it's just a little too early. You know, how we got to 5G is a whole lot of white papers from researchers and scientists from Ericsson and Huawei and Nokia and Qualcomm and people who live in that space. Because remember, it has to be a standard. We can't invent something that's super awesome, but it doesn't work with your phone and, and it doesn't cooperate with everyone. So you'll have all these people submitting white papers and working on things together mm -hmm. and, there'll be, and there'll be patents. Yeah. But in the end, it all has to be shared. It's called a, this pro, it's called 3GPP because everything has to work with everything else. And so with 5G, clearly we've made a lot of changes in the guts of the system. We are using higher frequencies that don't go as far, but go a whole lot faster. Uh, we've been able to do more with less with the hardware. And remember, this also affects you know, sustainability. We're using less energy to do more and, and work with more with 5G. 6G, I'm just going to guess it's going to be an exponential change and it's probably going to, it might look nothing like what we're doing today. Um, yeah. It won't be incremental. It might be and completely different. You should always expect to also, barbarians are always at your gate. 
So yes. it should be <laughs> right. where someone could come along and disrupt right. the entire industry. Yeah. So, you know, I think, you know, my strong belief is 6G will be the sixth experience for humans and machines, right? There's a strong bridge which will finally bond biology and artificial intelligence, you know, with embedded, you know, things ha happening. And I think, you know, it's enabling future for the, for the entirely new generation of applications shaping the communication networks of the future. That's, That's great. Well, look, I, we could go on another half an hour. Yes. I got a bunch of questions here and um, let's do this again in person sometime soon. Thanks again Absolutely. to both of you, Sam, and, and to BMC for your support. Rob, um, obviously, Erickson's been a longtime supporter of Techonomy, so thanks for that as well. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys at, at some point uh, in person. Thanks Thank for you, Drew. Me. Thank you, Rob. Thank thanks. you, gentlemen. Thanks, Bye. Sam.